Hi everyone, um, it's Natalie here, and it's a um, kind of a cold, rainy day in May. So that's St. Louis. So um, I'm here today to do a um, a walkthrough and a, a walk and talk. We'll call it a walk and talk for today um, about the <clears throat> the New Earth Tarot deck and handbook. So I got this last month. Um, my nickname for it is the Potter, the Buddhist Potter's Tarot. <laughs> the and box is gorgeous. Um, it is independently published. So Silver Dog Press is actually Kate Silver, one of the creators. It's her, you know, she, she's printing it. It's this is the deck itself. It is a round deck. Um, the backs do say second edition on them because this is a second edition deck. And, like the way that I came about this deck was kind of cool. I, I cover a friend um, at the pottery studio a lot um, when she has to be away to do her Reiki training. And <clears throat> when I started covering for her there, um, she said, look, can I give you a gift certificate, um, maybe like for Amazon or, you know, she often would get me a gift certificate for, um, for Starbucks, which I really like. Um, and I said, you know, this time I think Amazon would be best. And she was like, I thought so. Cause I thought maybe you might want to buy, you know, buy some decks you could get on Amazon. So I was thrilled when I realized I could actually get this particular deck on Amazon. Um, and I didn't need to go to her site for it. So she does sell it on Amazon. Um, and I thought since she, since the, the deck uh, creator is a potter and I'm a potter, and I got the money to buy the deck through working at the pottery studio, I thought, oh, I've never really shown any of my pottery work. So here's a mug that I made. There's my, my little signature on the bottom there. Um, I can't remember what the clay body is on this one, but um, yeah, and it's kind of like a this kind of teal turquoisey color on the inside as well. This one is a retired um, design. I call it the squiggle mug, um, but they did not sell. And <clears throat> so I just quit making them at one point. Here's another one, totally different clay body. Um, and on the inside, I painted it this kind of lavender color. Um, and here's a little bowl. It's the same one. It's got purple on it. Again, another clay body. It speckles a little bit on the inside. Anyway, I just had to share that because I was so geeked about the pottery connection. So, so the book is gorgeous. Um, all of the pages, the pages are kind of a nice shiny um, texture. And <clears throat> each of the cards, like no matter where you open it, it has a great full description um, and a full color image of the card, you know. So I have been able to take it, like, to school. Not that I ever really can read anything at school, but, um, you know, you can, you can take it and I can read it away from the deck and still know what she's referring to, which is great with a book that's this thick. Sometimes I just need to take, you know, something with me to read, and I love taking... Um, you know, the guidebooks for my, for my decks, because I, I can't help it. I try I trained in theater and literature and you read, 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 read and research before attempting to perform the task. So that's, you know, you don't write the paper without the research. You don't, um, you don't get up and act without having read the script multiple times, you know, a hundred times. And, um, done all your research and whatever. So I do need to, I really do need to read the guidebooks, like wherever it's possible. I really feel drawn to read them. So I have academentia. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. So now that we're all flipped around, um, and I can show you the actual deck. Um, I think there's some just basic things that I could cover, you know, about the deck itself before, um, before actually just flipping through the cards. Um, I'm going to err on the side of the way that Kelly from Truth and Story does things. Sorry, I've got tiny little ants that want to come in and hang out and be with me right now. And it's very um, disconcerting. The structure of the deck is not Rider Waitsmith. So I should say that right off the bat. Um, 
first clue, of course, is that justice is eight. I'm always fascinated by why different deck creators choose to flip those around um, and make that choice. So 11 is strength. Um, I will never know. Uh, I think so, some of them will mention it and some of them say nothing. Here we have the fool. Um, very barren landscape, carrying this, this little globe. Um, most of the interesting things to note are in the miners. So we'll get through this magician. I also feel, sorry, I know I always say like, oh, we're moving on, but you know, I love, I had this problem when I was a teacher as well. I love the, the use of the round, um, space like I feel like this deck creator really knows how to make like there's a purpose in it being round and she knows how to make use of that um of, of the round format as a medium for her work um high priestess empress was my card for today uh emperor I love this. He's he's such he's a provider. He's you know he's he's got a lot of warmth. He's going to take care of everybody. Hierophant. I have not read the description of Hierophant to know why he's carrying a severed head. Just thought lovers bringing together of two different two different things blending two things. She uses a lot of rainbow imagery in here as well and talks in various places very um, candidly and specifically about why she wants to use those rainbows. Um, triumph. So seven, instead of the chariot, we have, we have this card. And I don't, you know, again, coming right from the Marielle um, so intensely and deeply, I'm struggling with that a little bit. Um, but I know that like, getting, I love this, I have such a connection with this deck now after doing my deck interview last night that I know that that'll resolve itself. Justice. And what I love about this, they are intended to be read upside down and right side up. And then the nine, instead of the hermit, we have the wise one. And she's got the Enneagram, you know, and the all-seeing eye. Wisdom. The description of the snake is really, or of the her staff, is really wonderful. And I, she says in her book, it's a snake that she holds by its head, thus controlling the danger that great power might bring. And I just loved that. Wheel of Fortune. Beautiful Ouroboros encircling it. Uh, strength. Again, blessing the lion. <laughs> And making use of that roundness in the card. Love. I love this hanged one. Oh, I love this one so much. Um, but then we have the, the, you know, the moth. And I think it's very specific. It's a moth because here they are attracted to the flame and the light. Um, love, love, love the death card. And I remember I looked at it at first and I thought, is that supposed to be another Yoni? And it is. You know, that, you know, death is, is standing just outside another birth canal, ready to welcome you in to the next, next phase of your life. Temperance, Temperance is very different in this deck. I happen to love this. Um, I am a Sagittarius, so Temperance is sort of, I guess in some ways it's, it's a card that gets associated with Sagittarius and, um, this is definitely my experience of life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, being bashed, burned, seared, polished, and then allowed to carry a sword. Yep, that's that's how my my journey's gone. Sometimes the devil comes to you looking like this. And she put a naga in there, which is very Buddhist. Um yeah, very interesting. Like they're they're not separate, you know, the devil is inside of us and part of us is not separate. Um, the tower, very much a, an initiation happening in this tower. And the star, and I'll throw this out there. 
So I love that she did this. The first edition, the star was called the Way Shower. And <clears throat> she decided that that was unhelpful for some reason. In the second edition, the star is simply named the star. So, you know, there's, there's a, some form of rainbow bridge happening here. Um, in the background, we see a happy couple and their child. Um, you know, order has been restored. Happiness has been restored. Um, yeah. Then we have the moon. And again, another like high, you know, high priestess. We'll see this too reflected in the woman of cups, you know, gazing and scrying into the depths, um, and allowing something that's unconscious, subconscious, etc., to come forward or come up, um, which may or may not be pleasant, depending on, on what it is, but will probably be insightful. We have the, uh, the sun, and she has chosen to use a phoenix here. I tend to really enjoy that when, when deck creators use a phoenix, you know, somewhere uh, between, you know, 1920, somewhere in there around the, sorry about that slurp, around the sun and judgment, it feels right, you know, that there would be a phoenix there. Uh, here is judgment. Beautiful. And I love the way that judgment, it's, it looks like, you know, it's very inclusive. It's about in including everything. There's nothing outside. Uh, there is no other and then 21, which is all and everything. The universe and a grain of sand. Standing on top of the world. It's the dove and the promise of things being being better. She does mix her Christian, um, Christian iconography in here along with pretty much anything else that she feels is, is going to be relevant, which, you know, a lot of deck creators do. Um, <clears throat> she is, you know, this is, this is very much a deck that is coming out of her personal experience, um, of, of spiritual awakening. And I, I feel like that's really apparent. Um, so she does not work with the Rider Waite Smith system, as I mentioned before. And what we get here in, in the minors is also a rearrangement of them. So instead of them having their usual, um, wands, cups, swords, uh, pentacles. She's swapped cups and pentacles, and she's renamed uh, pentacles as mirrors, which I thought was a really, really interesting choice. Um, and I also like the way she's using it. There's another one of our little friends. That's really not comfortable for me. And it's that time of year. There's thing, thing, the earth is waking up and all of its guardians are coming out. Oh, I have a Robin. Hi. Robin literally popped its head up right outside my window and called to me and said hello. Um, little cutie. So the courts um, in her deck are very interesting. So she has a child card, um, you know, for each of the, uh, you know, for each, each element, each suit. Um, and, and there's cups and, uh, I love where she goes with this because what she's got essentially is a progression. So we have the little girl, you know, with her, with her, uh, light in the palm of her hand. And this little girl, she references later as being part of, uh, key nine. So the wise one is here in the majors holding that same light. So she does reference that. So there's a lot of references in the minors, and I love it when deck creators do that too. Um, you know, they make references in, you know, in, it, it doesn't stop, in other words. You know, the what happens in the majors is carried right through into the minors with significance and, and intention. Um, the adolescent of wands is wonderful. Um, I love the fire eating and I really love the way that she talks about the adolescent. 
So frequently the knights, I feel like the knights are frequently maligned um, as being kind of careless or, you know, too much of this, too much of that. She brings a real balance. Um, I feel like all of her cards carry that. This is, you know, keeping in mind too, we're looking at a practitioner of something that's essentially non-dual and she brings that non-dual perspective right into each card. You know, there is a positive and a negative. It's, it's just in, everything is included. You know, there's nothing left out. So yeah, he's a daredevil. He's, um, you know, a lot of fire eaters. And I remember this from trying it in college. Um, you know, you will burn your throat and burn your mouth, even though you coat it really carefully with, with the, the fuel and, and protectant and stuff. It still happens. Um, just, we had a circus arts class. I realized I just threw that out there. We had a circus art class when I was in college and um, we had the chance to try that. So kind of cool. Um, it, it was, it's dangerous and it's wonderful. There, I mean, few things could be as wonderful as like breathing fire, right? <laughs> um, especially if you're a really wandsy personality. Um, so that was pretty cool. And then she mentions too, very, very specifically, and maybe I'll find it in her book. Harlequin diamonds were a sim symbol of the gay movement in the 1950s. Sexual proclivity during adolescence can be a coming out to the world around them even if that world is hostile about their choice. Uh, the Fire Eater's long red hair shows his strength. Some ancient alchemists thought it was necessary to have the hair of a young red-headed man in order to create gold from copper, um, etc. And, she, you know, she says, The Adolescent of Wands is filled with amazing original ideas and creative solutions. Those around him are awed by his continual intuitive flow of images and words. Woman of Wands. This one has a lot of depth of meaning and intention in it as well. Um, she's got a, a crystal at the top of her staff. Um, the, all of the red is intended like to symbolize uh, sexuality, sexual maturity, and the blue bra is significant. This is not something, I meant to look that up before I did the video and I forgot. The blue bra, she mentions, again, I'll pull out my book here and see where it is. Um, da, 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 dancer, energy, Arab Spring. She says, when the Arab Spring occurred in late 2011, there erupted a story of the blue bra. A young Arab girl was dragged through Tahrir Square after joining the protesters. Her shirt had been torn from her body to reveal a bright blue bra. The Woman of Wands wears a similar bra. The blue bra has become a symbol of solidarity with those who fight against the oppression of women throughout the world. This is an important position for the Woman of Wands in her role as a warrior teacher. So, you know, as a significator, this is a card that would likely be used for me. Um, and I love that you know, that that is included as part of who she is. And then we have the Man of Wands, who is an alchemist. Um, now, in this suit, which is a masculine suit, she's balanced it pretty well. Um, and she doesn't necessarily speak about the evolution of these court cards as being you know, uh, which you often get with court cards, like the queen is just left out. So we get, you know, page, knight, and king having some kind of flow. And then the queen is sort of off here to the side, like, oh, well, she's does this. She's integrated all of it. So she's taking a very Jungian approach um, to the whole idea in the sense that, you know, you start as a child, you go to an adolescent, you become an adult, and each you know, both the man and woman hold different qualities, but you're intended to view them like this or like this, which is definitely a reflection of the human soul. Here's the child of mirrors, adolescent of mirrors. This child is male. Um, I thought, boy, that could be a little boy or a little girl, but she has chosen to make that a male child. Adolescent is female or female identified, man of mirrors, who's sculpting, and then woman of mirrors. So as a feminine suit, which the pentacles traditionally are, 
she reverses the man and woman. So the top of the suit uh, is dominated by the woman. The man comes next, then adolescent and child. And there's no real preference here. I thought maybe there might be, but even, let's see, in, so here's uh, cups, suit of cups. We have a female child, a female adolescent, you know, the man and the woman. And then in swords, we have a uh, child, male child, male adolescent, woman of swords, man of swords. So there's no real like rhyme or reason other than just simply, you know, to the like the way she depicts gender in the courts, except that at the top, you know, in the top echelon where you usually get king and queen, if it's a male suit that's, do you know, the man will dominate the court, you know, of that suit. And if it is a female suit, the woman will dominate it. And I like that. Um, I just feel, but it, it feels balanced. Again, it just feels balanced. And where you have one, I guess they're kind of mixed gender. And then you have one that's like very, you know, the, the cups are very female heavy. There's only one male. Um, the swords are all uh, male heavy. And then there's one female. And then, you know, when you get to the other two suits, it's pretty mixed. All swords are wonderful. Um, I could really talk about this deck at great length. Um, oh, I mean, this, she uses the analogy, you know, of, um, a lamb, someone dressed as a lamb who's a wolf inside. Is that what it was? I'm going to get this wrong. Here we go. The woman of swords is a warrior for the truth. She's clad for the cold of winter in the skin and fur of the lamb, but she's anything but a lamb at heart. She is the bearer of the Russian shashka, a symbol of the warrior, ready for the battle of the spirit. Love that. Love that. Um, yeah. And then, of course, here we've got, you know, the yogi, the meditative yogi, who is cold and distant and absolutely knows his mind, knows himself, is wise embodies the suit of swords in a way that is incredible, um, masterful at a level that few of us will ever attain. Um, and then, you know, the skill she uses for, for the adolescent of swords, she's got a wonderful um, quote. So she says, Martin Luther King, this is how she opens the description. Martin Luther King Jr. said, nonviolence is a powerful and just weapon. It is a unique weapon in history which cuts without wounding and ennobles the man who wields it. It is a sword that heals. That heals. Um, learning to be with conflict in a way that's nonviolent, but cuts through to the meaning and the depth and the wisdom that's inherent in a situation. Get finally the suit of cups, and here we have. I love this. We've got this contrast happening. Little girl has a tea party, and we have the extraordinary, wise uh, Buddhist teacher who is preparing a tea ceremony. Uh, that's Kate. Let's see. She's a hol certified holotropic breathworker facilitator and a teacher of Aikido and Omo Tensenk Tensenke Tea. At any rate, there we have the adolescent. She lives in California, so the waves are pretty pretty sick there. And she talks about literally the, the genius of, you know, someone who is able to ride, ride waves and take a risk like this and yet, you know, embody that kind of vital force and, and intelligence that's inherent in water. And then the Woman of Cups, love this. Uh, again, she's got a scrying pool in front of her in that bowl. And... You know, she's filling it with water. It reminds me a little bit of Galadriel from Lord of the Rings. So there are our courts. And we can get them out of the way now. So she's chosen to use the fire salamander in the wands. Uh, and work with crystals. Two of wands. Again, the, that kind of dynamic... Um, 
force that has held between the two and the fieriness, the electricity. Um, yeah, that's in there as well. She's working very much with element, you know, to get these car these images, she has worked with element and number. So the three of wands is described as the creative sexual um, vitality that rises up and comes through us or burns us up. I was not expecting this. Um, so she talks about the four of wands and, and her use of La Santa Muerte for this one. And um, it made me wonder if she, if she had that, had an experience with Santa Muerte because of the way she talks about her. Um, I had a really powerful experience myself with, with Santa Muerte. Was, you know, I, I knew nothing about her. Um, I knew nothing, nothing. I really knew nothing. And I had to go and find out. And it was such an important, vital um, aspect of that experience that I hardly... I, I still clearly need to process it. I think what makes me think that maybe the author had that connection with Santa Muerte specifically, not only just the use of her, but um, the the four candles and the idea of this as a portal. Um, and the four of, of wands is, is I, I feel anyway, looking at uh, the, the traditional RWS, and I'm sure that this must be in one of the books somewhere. I'm sure it is. But though that the four of wands in in RWS is um, very much about going going from one place to another place, you know. Uh, but right at that moment where there's a portal, um, again, very much about her Buddhist practice that's that's in here. And it does hold the kind of conflict that the traditional five of wands would have, but it's less about it being an external conflict, and it's much more about resolving conflict within the self, obviously. Six of wands, beautiful. And the way she's she's talking about this one is, is divine, you know, that kind of divine connection uh, that takes place in, in through practice. Seven of Wands is not something most of us will have seen before. And while I love this card, I'm, this is maybe the only one in the deck that to me is like, what? Are you sure? I'm not sure I understand, Kate. Um, so it is a cremation. It is a cremation ceremony. Uh, her meaning for this one is courageous living, being true to yourself, calling forth the great spirit. I guess that, like, when I look at it from that simplicity, it's a little easier. When I read her description, I felt a little confused. Um, let's see. So here's the reading. So the intention in the card is to be true to yourself. And then upright, she says, you can feel good about your insistence on being true to yourself. This has taken much courage. It has not always been easy, but you have a good support system of close friends and family that love you for who you are. The spirit always honors the truth. Feedback could be can be good, but remember who you're talking to. Yeah, I feel like when I just saw the simple um, explanation of this card, it was easier to take in. Um, so just courageous living, being true to yourself, and calling forth of the great spirit, that makes sense to me. Eight. This one's very much about balancing of energies. The nine, there's a balance in this one as well, and it's about expression of, of oneself as as a wise embodied being. Uh, Ten of Wands, again, you know, it's uh, it, it does still hold that uh, implication of destruction or um, of everything coming together. Let's see. Ten of Wands. Yeah, the uh, to be able to sustain the powerful energies that are coming your way without blocking them. Mirrors. So I love this ace. It is such a, you know, let me hand you the world. <laughs> really holds the essence of where she's going with, with this. Two of mirrors. A woman who's able to, to gain deep insight about herself in the world through the use of mirrors, mirror, mirroring, gazing, scrying, um, you know, I have 
I have several scrying implements here on my on my desk that are always around. Um, it is so meditative. I don't really do it anymore. Um, but after seeing this deck, maybe, I don't know, I kind of feel like maybe I should um, have a go at it again. I don't know how I would be with it. And I just saw Tom Benjamin's video <laughs> about Reader Studio and everybody at Reader Studio got to try uh, on Divination Day, got to try a little bit of crystal ball scrying, which I thought was really cool. So anyhow, there's two. Three of mirrors, beautiful. Just love this. Um, and, you know, her interpretation is very much about the creativity of, of giving birth to something. She also says, birth is seldom easy. It takes a considerable amount of energy and focused attention. Yet, if the birth does not take place, neither the mother nor the child will survive. So the intention of this one is to have the self-confidence to push through to the end of a process. So this one is still eluding me. I need to kind of dig deeper. It's, a, it's probably one of the most esoteric cards in the entire deck uh, in terms of it being really hard to get. Um, I feel like maybe she kind of overcomplicated the suit of mirrors a little bit for us, but through her interpretation and yet... I, you know, I just kind of also just need a little more time with it. It's just not, it's not in yet. Um, five of mirrors, I love. So we have this potter. It's a beautiful day outside. Only has four pots. And his kiln is empty. So it's really about sticking it out and continuing to do the work, even when it's slow, even when it's tedious. Um, even when you could be outside playing, sometimes you just have to keep going. Love that. Okay, six of mirrors kind of holds, or, you know, six of pentacles holds a lot of what we're used to in it. Um, she intends that this could either be two women or a man and a woman. She's very specific about that in the book. Seven is very different. Um... Seven, again, all the sevens have a spiritual dimension to them. And in this one, she intends that you, you know, we're taking these slow steps, slow and steady towards our own spiritual development to get to the pagoda. Traditionally, the pagoda, you know, the, the when they, the Japanese were creating these, um, they realized they weren't strong enough as a structure to really withstand an earthquake. The pagoda is held upright and held steady by a large central pine um, piece of pine, you know, like a, an entire tree trunk that's, that is then placed on the inside to keep it stable and hold the, um, basically absorb the shock from an earthquake. The eight has a little bit of a, uh, a moral um, component to it. She's talking about excess and balance, living with too much excess and destroying the earth versus having just enough balance and being able to nourish the earth. She says, newness amidst the ancient, magic of working together, wisdom of the many, harmony in process and enjoyment. Um, working on a project such as this creates a high degree of satisfaction which will flow from one generation to the next, spanning over many generations of time. If this work can be done with a happy heart, then wisdom, love, and creativity pour into the moment, etc. The universe is available to us. So this is about permanent impermanence. These planets feel so far away and like there's such an anchor of permanence and yet they too are impermanent. Beautiful Ace of Swords. Love the use of all of this roundness. Two of Swords. Again, still about balance and having the actual swords sheathed. So, you know, mental balance, mental stability. Three of Swords. Gorgeous. Um, Four of Swords, and this is about focusing the mind not to put it to rest, but to put it to work. Five of Swords, Six, 
seven. This is supposed to be Icarus carrying swords. Big lesson about spiritual balance. Eight of swords, very, very strongly relating back to the justice card. And then we have the nine, which again relates back to our wise one. We have the Enneagram, we have the eye, cold, lofty, that I think is supposed to be Mount Everest. We have the cups, beautiful one of cups, ace of cups. Two, three of cups, four of cups. This four is about the energy of our lives being kind of held in suspension and being kind of frozen, having a frozen heart, um, being too rigid and needing to open up a little more. Five of cups is still about despair. She's pouring out her emotion, and she's trying to handle everything by herself. Um, six. Again, very much like what we're accustomed to with the Six of Cups. Similar energy. Seven of Cups. So Seven of Cups, uh, again, spiritually, it's about opening the heart. So there's all of this beautiful water here. So why is this landscape so barren? Why is it, you know, why are there only just now like little bits of grass? So it's about softening and opening the heart, letting go of rigidity. The eight is very much about self-blessing. And then the nine, these are nine different muses. And she talks about how they're ready to uh, be a muse and to be amused and that they're, they're still holding their seriousness because it's at a tipping point, which is very much in, in keeping with the quality of the nines. And then a ten. Wow. Double rainbows. And in this card, her description is beautiful. She really talks at great length about rainbows, their significance, um, different cultures and the way they relate to rainbows, and the ways in which... This card is intended to symbolize and hold all of that um, richness, beauty, value, um, and blessing. So, yeah. Um, and again, she included in the, in the deck, with the deck, her old Nine of Swords. I feel so strongly like this is just a much better choice. Um... And frankly, like, I saw the Nine of Swords, I saw that there was a choice, and I was like, oh, I take this one. You know, I knew I wanted that one and not this one. And when it came to choosing, before I knew that that's what had happened, like, do I want the way shower? Do I want the star? I was like, yeah, I think I just want the star. So <clears throat> let's talk about the aspect of diversity in here. Um, so what I feel like I'm seeing here is a story being told by a white woman um, who has a very inclusive mindset. You know, so are they inclusive? Yes, they are inclusive. I feel like this could potentially be a non-white person of color. Um, Where there is, I mean, these are people who are perhaps not white. You know, I think she does intend that card to be someone from another culture. I know she intends this one to be someone who's not white, but could be. Same here. This one is an inclusive card. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of Asian culture included here. And again, I call this an inclusive card. <clears throat> um, that one's relatively inclusive. But you can see, you know, looking through, <clears throat> I don't know that it's necessarily something she contemplated. I think she... 
I think she probably was drawing from um, from just her own perspective, <clears throat> which happens to also include people of color. Okay, so I'm back. I have a greater sense here of what we're looking at. So <clears throat> these are the cards that carry some form of inclusivity or depict people who are not white. Okay, there's 14. Um, these all depict white people. These include images that do not, uh, either don't, you know, they're not with people in them or, or whatever. They don't include where we can identify, you know, race, race or, or gender. So that's really, really telling. That's really telling. I would say um, that, you know, I appreciate her perspective and I appreciate her, uh, you know, intent at, at inclusivity because that's, it's a very clear intent and where it happens, it is, um, you know, like in this card, I love that. I just love that. Um, it's very powerful or it can be. But to see so few people of color in a deck is also kind of, it bothers me on some, on some levels. Um, it won't stop me from, in this case, from appreciating the deck. Um, I would say, you know, there's a lot of missed opportunities where, you know, a person is depicted and, you know, or even just, um, there was like hands, right? where sure that uh i mean they just they those could be multiple different but especially that one could be different races but they're basically he's most easily interpreted as white um you know there's just a lot of opportunities in here where the people depicted could be non-white you know these are white hands very apparently pink undertones and so on um Justice is depicted as, as a white woman. Um, so I would say, like, if if Kate Silver were to see this, um, <clears throat> and I, I don't know that she would or wouldn't. I really don't know. Um, time will tell. I would say, generally speaking, it would be really nice, you know, if you're considering redrawing, to contemplate uh, where there are opportunities for the um the people included in the cards not to be white you know there's just so many possible opportunities in here where that could happen and the people in included don't need to be white that, that is a little disappointing in truth um in a deck that feels at least from the box whoops um like it's going to be a very inclusive and diverse deck so that's just something for the deck creator to think about. I just, you know, I don't know that necessarily all of the cards have to be redrawn or anything. I just think um, where it's possible for there to be, you know, a different race included. I think that's just such a, a missed opportunity. Just such a missed opportunity. So, um, yeah, this is the deck. As I say, I've had some pretty powerful experiences um, of working with it. I would like to edge it in orange <clears throat> or some shade of yellow. I haven't found my markers. I bought some recently, and I don't know where they disappeared to, but I've been moving a lot of things around in the house. They shuffle like a dream. Um, you can overhand or them a riffle and they they really function beautifully so I really feel this is a very underrated deck um, I can't believe more people in the community haven't tried it so I do I do recommend it there there is quite a bit of representation in it 14 cards to be specific she does also borrow from other cultures which could be regarded as appropriation but I feel like when you read the book, which, again, is written really beautifully. <clears throat> I mean, the book itself, she's a wonderful writer. 
just a wonderful writer. Um, and if you read her descriptions, her whole approach is inclusive. I mean, she has read, she's very, very broadly read, um, and inclusivity is clearly a big part of who she is. It's just, again, it's just too bad that there aren't more cards in this deck that really reflect that. So, yeah, wonderful deck, wonderful deck. I'm not sure what grade Tom Benjamin would give it. Maybe like a, <clears throat> probably a C, um, C minus, I don't know. I don't think he would give it a very high rating. Um, and I'm not saying that I need to hold the same standards, and yet I'm... I feel like the, you know, the, it raises a lot of the questions that I ask, a lot of the things that I contemplate. Certainly, if I were the one creating a deck <clears throat> and using a, you know, creating a deck with people and images of people in it, that would be the first thing I'd be looking for: is ways to um, ways in which the cards tell me that they don't, you know, that they may best represent someone who is not cisgender right, or might represent, you know, they're just opportunities where maybe a traditional representation is there, um, and it doesn't need to be. I don't know. Anyway, there we are. This was uh, the second edition of this, I'm thinking, came out, I'm trying to remember, I know the original, this one's 2016. The original came out, I think, in 2012. So the first was, was 2016, or 2012, the second was 2016. So maybe in another year or two, you know, she may want to come out with another one where, where there is more, they're even more inclusive than they are now. Uh, just an idea. Any and at any rate. Wow, I'm stumbling everywhere over my words. See you again soon.